and we're in chapter number 8, and we're going to be looking at from verse 25 this morning down to the end of the chapter. Let's just pause and uh, look to the Lord uh, in prayer before we look at the Word. Uh, Father, we're thankful that we can be found together in your presence today. We're, we're so thankful, Lord, for the wonderful gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we do pray now that you bless us as we look into the pages of the Word. I pray that our hearts would be encouraged. I pray, Lord, that our walk with you would be uh, drawn closer to you, Lord. And I pray that as we uh, look into this passage today, that we would be mindful of who our Saviour is and what he's done for us at Calvary. So do bless us, we do pray, for we ask this in the precious name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. Well, we continue with this particular discussion. It's kind of a heated discussion, I suppose, uh, that we see in chapter 8 uh, from verses 12 through to the end of the chapter. And as I said last week, there's a lot of information, so it's really difficult to, to look at the whole passage just at one, at one time. But um, we saw that there were four divisions. And last week we looked at verses 12 to 19, uh, Jesus and his witness. And then from verse 20 to verse 24, Jesus and his world. And then we'll continue now looking at from verse 25, and we'll see Jesus and his word. And then we'll also look at Jesus and his walk. So there's a great, uh, great deal of truth that we can essentially get from this passage today. You know, one of the questions that is often asked today, it's a question that has been Asked, I suppose, ever since Jesus did walk upon this earth, and even as he stood before Pilate, it was a question that was asked. And the question is, essentially, who is Jesus? And millions of people have asked this question, and and millions of people have answered this question. And some have they come to an understanding and come to an answer, uh, they have believed to uh, salvation and have the gift of eternal life, They've come to the right understanding of exactly who Jesus is. But then on the other hand, there's been some people that have asked the question, and even though all of the facts have been given to us concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, both in the pages of the Word of God, and also what we have from historical documents as well, even though they have all of this information about Christ, their hearts are still filled with essentially unbelief, just as to who Jesus Christ is. And the question as is, who is Jesus, is such an important question because the eternal destiny of a man's or a woman's soul hangs in the balance as to how they'll answer this particular question. I'm thankful that when I read the Bible and I I come across people that are, are confronted with Christ, who perhaps at one time were uh, initially filled with unbelief that they they essentially came to a good understanding of who he was. I think of Thomas. Initially, he didn't believe that he had res- been resurrected from the, from the dead. And even today, we think of him as doubting Thomas. But let me tell you something. It's a bit of a misnomer. He's no longer doubting. He only doubted for a period of about eight days. And then he doubted no more. But forever, we, rem- we think of ourselves as poor old Doubting Thomas. When you get to heaven, you don't call him Doubting Thomas. He's probably have something he wants to say to you then. He says, I don't doubt. Because when he came into the presence of Jesus, and Jesus said to him, here's my hands, and here's my side, thrust, hither, you know, thrust your finger through the prints of my hands, and put your hand in my side, and you couldn't imagine for a minute that he would. But you know what his response was when he was confronted with the living Lord? fell on his face and he said, my Lord and my God. He understood exactly the, question, the answer to the question of who is Jesus. And as we look at our text this morning, we'll see that this is one of the questions that is asked. So we'll firstly consider Jesus and his word from verse 25, and we'll read down to verse number 45. John chapter 8, verse 25. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say, 
and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I've heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And as he spoke these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. But the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then they said unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceedeth forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. So as Jesus speaks to them, I'd like you to notice that the, the reoccurring thing in this particular discourse here is as to how often he speaks about the truth, how often he speaks about the word that he has given to them, the things that he's speaking to them about. So they begin by saying, who are you? And Jesus essentially answers and says, well, I am the same person that I've always told you that I am. They would never accept it. They would never believe it. But he says, I haven't changed. I'm the same person that I told you that I was. But, you know, Jesus is so gracious. You and I, we would say, well, you don't want to listen to me. You don't want the truth. And it's so easy for us where we just turn on our heel and we go our way. But not Jesus. He, he looks at them and he continues to give them more and more evidence for the fact that he is indeed who he says he is. So he graciously continues to talk to them, even though they're in their unbelief. Now I can notice a few things about the word that he gives to them. Firstly, he gives to them a word about his father. And he speaks to them about the fact that he was sent from God and that he was in complete obedience to God. He did, he did everything that God had ever told him to do. He was obedient to his father. You know, you've heard of that statement before, like father, like son. And let me tell you something, as fathers, that should really be a sobering thing because we want to live our lives in such a way where we're going to set an example for our children. Because like it or not, they follow in our footsteps. So we need to set a good example for our children. I like you to notice that he speaks about the fact that he had come to fulfill the Father's will for him in this life. He was continually obedient. And you remember last week I spoke about three things that should be kind of like stepping stones in our life. We should uh, wake up in the morning thinking to ourselves, I must be about my father's business. I must be about his will. 
And as we go through the day, we should say like Jesus, that I'm doing always the things that please him. And as we lay our heads on a pillar at night, we should be able to say, well, I've finished the work that is given me to do. We need to be a people that are going to be obedient to our Father. Now notice what he says. He gives to them, as he speaks about it, the Father, he gives to them some words concerning a future judgment. And this was something that the Jews, it would resonate with them because they, they viewed judgment as something that belonged to God and to God alone. And of course, even today, we have that same prevailing view where people think that they are going to just, they're going to stand before God the Father and before God the Father, they will give an account. And that is something that really should strike fear into the hearts of men's, men and women's hearts because our God is a consuming fire, the Bible tells us. And so people go through life and they curse and they blaspheme the name of the Son of the Father, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they use His name as a byword and as a swear word. But you know what the Bible tells us? The Bible tells us that God has committed all judgment to the Son. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 30 and 31, the Bible says that, and Paul is here, he's preaching at, at, on Mars Hill, and you'll, you know that you remember the story, they had an altar to all different types of gods, and then he saw an altar to one God, to the unknown God, and he said, well, I'll declare him to you. And in verse 30 he says this, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. Now notice this phrase. By that man which he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Let me tell you something. That leaves us in absolutely no doubt as to who the Bible is speaking of here. The person... The one that is going to be the judge of all of mankind is none other than God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. So we need to understand that judgment is something that has been committed to God the Son. And the fact that all judgment has been committed to God the Son, that should cause these Jewish leaders to look at the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's talking about the fact that he is God in the flesh, that they should recognize that he's the judge. Now, at his first coming, Jesus didn't come to judge. He came to provide a way of salvation. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save. And even today, we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is one who delights to save. But there's coming a day where that moment, where that opportunity for salvation will have passed, and no longer will man look at him as a means of salvation, but will look upon him as the one who has come to judge. And so Jesus appears to these Pharisees, and he's declaring the fact that God is the judge, and he's in their midst. He's God in the flesh. And they wouldn't understand. They couldn't understand. Now, you would have thought that people that were wise and prudent, people that had the Bible, that they would kind of understand these things. But they didn't. A little child would perhaps understand it. But these so-called doctors of the law didn't understand it. Uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 21 says, Thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. We understand it today. We understand exactly what Jesus is talking of. But these doctors of the law, they didn't 
understand. And so Jesus goes on and he speaks about his own death and how that in his death that would prove that he had come from the Father. And he uses this term uh, being lifted up. And this term being lifted up, it has, it's one of those terms in the Bible that has a dual meaning. Because when you think of Jesus being lifted up, firstly it has the meaning of Jesus going to Calvary. He would be lifted up upon the cross, and as he's lifted up upon the cross, he would pay the penalty for the sins of mankind. He would make the way possible that people could be righteously forgiven. But this term, being lifted up, is dual because it also has a reference to his glorification. So when you think of Jesus being lifted up today, you think of him in his glory. You don't necessarily think of him in his sufferings. And you know, when Jesus used this term, being lifted up, he didn't really divide, as you and I might, he didn't really divide his sufferings from his glory. It was, as far as he was concerned, part of the same thing. He combined the two. In uh, John chapter 12 and verse 23, the Bible says, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He's talking about his death. And so he uses this term being lifted up and he, in connection with this idea of the glorification that would follow. When... Uh, in verse 24, the, the very next verse goes on to say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He's talking about his death, and he's, thinking, he's talking about the fruit, the harvest that would follow after Calvary. And then when, when, when Judas would betray the Lord... In John chapter 13, Jesus said of this in verse 31, When he was gone out, speaking of Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So you can see that this term being lifted up, it certainly does have to do with his suffering upon the cross, but we shouldn't separate it necessarily from the glory of it as well. You know, there are some people today that would tell you that to glory in the cross is a gruesome thing. And it's something that as Christians we shouldn't do because that's the hour of the, the, the weakness, the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should focus just upon the resurrection. But don't focus upon that moment of weakness upon the cross. But nothing could be further from the truth. We sing, there is power wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. The fact that Jesus died upon the cross, it wasn't in a moment of weakness. Let me tell you something. It was in a moment of power. Because as He died upon the cross, He was paying the penalty for man's sin, and He was putting the death blow upon that wicked serpent. It is a glorious thing when you think of Calvary. Never think of it as weakness. Never think of it as something that should be bypassed. It is something that we should embrace. That's why Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. But when you think of Jesus being lifted up and it has his dual meaning, of his death and his glorification, really we should embrace that as his, there is glory in what Christ did for us at the cross. And even when he died upon the cross, that Roman centurion, a man who had seen, it could have been hundreds, thousands of people die in a similar way. But when he saw the way Jesus died, he smoked his breast, and he said, truly, this was the Son of God. This isn't just any man. The, he was who he said he was as he saw Jesus die upon the cross. And so Jesus goes on and he says, not only was he sent by the Father, but he says that the Father was with him. 
in verse 28 and 29. He says, Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. So as He continues this word about His Father, He speaks about the fact that the Father is ever present with Him. And then he gives to us, he moves the conversation slightly from uh, his father and the work that his father had sent him to do. But he has to us a word about faith. Because as he speaks these words, and there's a crowd gathered around the Lord Jesus Christ as he's speaking in the temple. It's not just the Pharisees that are the audience. There's ordinary men and women that are listening to this he did exchange between Jesus and between the Jews. And as this heated exchange goes on, we read that there are many that believe on him. Verse 30, as he spake these words, many believed on him. And this was the beginning of their faith. They heard his words. And doesn't the Bible say that faith cometh by hearing? And hearing by the word of God, they heard his words and it resonated within them. And they recognized that these words were true. Truly never a man spake like this man. And with every attack that the Pharisees made upon him, Jesus was graciously able to speak the truth of God's word. They said, yes, this is true. He most certainly is sent from the Father. He most definitely is the Son of God, it resonated with them, and they believed the Word. And the question that uh, is often put before us is, is that person really born again? Now, if these words resonate with you this morning, and you say, well, yes, I believe it. I know that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. I have placed my faith and my trust in Him. I know that He died upon the cross for me. I know that He was buried and He rose again the third day. Because of my faith in Him, I know that I'm a child of God. We believe on Him. And these people, this is pre-Calvary, so they could just have to take His word. And Calvary was yet to come. They believed on Him. And the question that we would have is, well, were these people really saved? In the same way that a person might say today, is that person really saved? And the fact of the matter is, we don't know one another's hearts, do we? We don't know just what your, I don't know what your relationship is with God. That's between you and God. I, I've not been called to be a judge. I'm not going to stand here and try and divide sheep from goats and say, you're saved, you're unsaved. That's not my business, that's God's business. He knows exactly who are his children and i would say to you this morning if you're saved you know you know if you're his child your spirit bears witness with his spirit that you are the child of god but jesus as he gives us this word about faith he gives to us some idea as to whether we know whether a person is saved or not i'd like you to notice if you look at verse 31, the, the next verse. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Notice he says, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. How can I know that I'm a child of God? How can I know that I've got the real thing? Jesus says, if you continue in my word, if you do what the Bible says do, then are you my disciples indeed. You know, the fact of the matter is, the Bible says that in that day, talking about the time when people are going to be ushered into the presence of God, Jesus said, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
Have we not prophesied in thy name? <coughs> Have we not in thy name done many wonderful works? And Jesus will say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It's not just a matter this morning of saying, Lord, Lord. It's not just a matter this morning of saying, well, you know, I, I've become more religious and I'm trying to do my very best as I go through life's journey now. That's not what it is. If you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to be seen as you continue in his word. And if you're not continuing in his word, then that's a clear indication that you don't have faith in Christ. It's no wonder that Paul would say, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. You know, I think as, as we go through life's journey, we give so much attention to our physical health. What's my pulse like? I, I don't even really know. I have to take, take my own pulse, but I know my heart's beating. But I think it's a good thing just to kind of, you know, what's my physical health like? That's a good thing. Let me take a spiritual checkup. What's my spiritual life like? Am I in the faith? Am I obeying what God's word says do? Or do I read it and just think, well, that's not for me. I'll make up my own minds. I'll, this is my life. I'll make my own decisions independently of the word of God. Let me tell you, a, a, a person who has been saved, a blood-bought child of God, has a desire to continue in his word. That's how we can really know. And so these people gathered around Jesus. They heard him speak. The Jews were kind of clashing swords with Jesus. But there were some there that believed, many there that believed. And Jesus said, if you continue in my word then are you my disciples indeed. Are you continuing in his word? Are you saying, I'm taking the word of God, I don't just read it, I want to obey it. I want to do what the Bible says do. That's an indication that you are indeed a child of God. And then there's another indication here, because Jesus spoke of this fact, and he, it's one of those verses in the Bible that is probably one of the most more misquoted verses because many say it like this, verse 32 and you shall know the truth and this is how they say it and the truth shall set you free but the Bible says and the truth shall make you free and here's an indication that you are a blood bought child of God not only are you continuing in his word but you've been made free the chains of bondage have kind of come loose and Jesus has made you free. If this morning you find yourself still to be in bondage, those chains kind of jingle wherever you go, that's an indication that you're still a stranger to the grace of God. Jesus speaks about the difference between a son and a servant in these verses. A, a son is someone, that's not to say that a son doesn't sin ever. But a son isn't a slave to sin. A son is somebody that is, you know, he's got the wonderful privilege of knowing that he's a part of that family. And there's a future for him. There's always a place at the table. But a servant doesn't have that same assurance. A servant doesn't really have any long-term definite future with that family. He abides in the house, but he doesn't belong in the house. If you're a child of God, then you will know the wonderful joy of having been made free by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful uh, indication of your eternal salvation abiding in his word and doing what the word of God says and then the freedom that you have uh, is no longer being enchained to sin and to bondage. 
But this religious bunch that he spoke to, they were so proud. And, and there's something about religion that makes us proud. Don't tell me. I know what I believe. I, you know, we, we become so proud. And we don't want to know anything else because we know it all. But this religious bunch was so proud when they heard Jesus speak about bondage and sin. You know, they said, we've never been in bondage to any man. Listen, you could go to the son of the class behind and they would tell you that the Jews know what it's like to be in bondage. Right from the time of Egypt. Right through to when they were carried away in captivity to Babylon. They were a people that were in and out of bondage. They said, we've never been in bondage to any man. They were so blind to the truth, they couldn't see all of Rome in Jerusalem. They were in bondage at that very time. But they said, we've never been in bondage to any man. And isn't that just like a a person who is unsaved today, proud in their religion, proud in what they believe, don't tell me I know what I'm doing, what I'm doing. I'm not in bondage. I'm a child of God. But they don't continue in his word. And the chattels of sin have got them fastened way down. But I'm not in bondage, they would say. Uh, Jesus came so that he could make free. So we see Jesus and his words. He speaks about his relationship with the Father. And he speaks about those that would have faith. And then let's just go on. We look at the final part of this chapter, verses 46 to the end of the chapter. Jesus and his walk. (coughs) Verse 46. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, (coughs) hast the devil? Jesus answered, I am not a devil, but I honor my Father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he will never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honour myself, my honour is nothing. It is my father that honoureth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. The Pharisees could no longer refute his words. So when you're having an argument with somebody, and you're not able to win the argument, the next step is is to attack the person. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did. They attacked his person. In fact, verse 41 that we had read earlier, where it says, we be be not born of fornication, that most certainly could be an attack on the the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, because it may have been somewhat public knowledge 
that uh, Mary was with child before she and Joseph were married. Of course, coming to the wrong conclusion that Joseph was the father and not to have been the child of the Holy Ghost. But I think there was a misunderstanding on the birth of Christ. To the Jews, to be called a Samaritan was a terrible insult. And then to be called someone that was demon-possessed, <coughs> that was a further wicked insult on the person of Christ. They're attacking his person. They are seeking to dishonor him. And he doesn't dignify the insults with answers. I'd just like you to notice that he draws attention to two main things about himself. He first he speaks about his essential sinlessness. In verse 46 he says, Which of you convinceth me of sin? With all of their wicked accusations, with all of the terrible things that they said about him, there was not one person that could point an accusing finger at him and say, yes, but you did. Yes, but you whatever. Nobody could point a finger of accusation at Jesus. He was absolutely sinless. Nobody could point a finger at him. Even Pilate, even someone that was determined to find a fault in Jesus so that he could have as best of a clear conscience as he could, he would have to say, I find no fault in this man. And the fact of the matter is, is there was no fault in him. He was absolutely sinless. For you and I, we have sins and many, but Jesus Christ was absolutely perfect and absolutely sinless. And it's absolutely vital that that was so. If Jesus was a sinner, then he wouldn't be God in the flesh. He wouldn't be a good man. He wouldn't be a good prophet. And if he was a sinner, he would need saving. He couldn't save you. And he couldn't save me. He would need someone to save him. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus is absolutely sinless. You know, when Jesus was tempted by the devil after that 40 days of fasting, that temptation wasn't to see whether or not he could sin. That temptation was to prove that he could not sin. He is absolutely impeccable. And so when you think of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to recognize that he is absolutely sinless. Which of you convinceth me of sin, he says. That is vital. Because the Bible says that he who knew no sin would become sin for us. He would go to Calvary. And the sinless, spotless Lamb of God would take upon the sins of every man, woman, and child that would be born into this world and Jesus would pay the penalty and the price absolutely in full. He would become the very embodiment of all the wicked and vile sins that ever could be committed. He would become sin. And being the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, He would be able to be the sacrifice for our sins. So Jesus, as they attack His character, as they attack his person, he says, which of you convinces me of sin? There is no sin in him whatsoever. And then I'd like you to notice he also speaks about, not just of his sinless perfection, but he speaks about his eternal sonship. In verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. Now, a number of times we've read in this chapter as to how the Jews had made claim to their ancestry way back to Abraham. Verse 56, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. But I'd like you to notice that in this discord, they, discourse, there's a continual disruption. As he tries to lay out the truth for them, they continually interrupt him. And they interrupt him by saying, 
Uh, you're not even 50 years old. And, and notice, has thou seen Abraham? They were misquoting Jesus. Jesus is saying, Abraham saw my day and was glad. they saying, you're not even 50. Have you seen him? Now, speaking as a man, Jesus hadn't seen Abraham. He had been on the earth for just some 30 odd years. But as the eternal son of God, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Abraham was born, Jesus Christ never was born, he is the eternal Son of God. And of course this again was something that infuriated the Jews, that he would use this statement, I am. Because the Jews understood that state, that statement, I am, was a statement of deity. I am, that I am, is God. And they hated him. For saying and proclaiming this truth, I am. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You know, Abraham looked forward to the day. He went through this life looking for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking forward to that day. But Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. He is the eternal. Son of God. We, I've said this to you before to try and help you understand this eternality of Christ. Is you think of God, the Bible speaks of God as being the eternal Father. If He's the eternal Father, He's had an eternal Son. I'm a father of 23 years old. How old is my son? 23. If God's the eternal Father, how old is His son? He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's never had a beginning, and he never will have an end. So this is quite an interesting discourse, and I'd like you to notice, and I would encourage you to read it and reread it, to try and get a good understanding as to what's happening. Because it would seem to me, as they gather together in the court of the, of the temple there, that, you know, you sometimes you see those movies where you've got these medieval people jousting and hear the, the clashing of the swords and, and you can hear the, you know, the, the fight that's going on as they spar and as they challenge one another. Well, this fight wasn't a, a fight with swords and the clanging and the clattering of shields. This was a fight with words. And they were determined to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was able to defeat them with his words as he proclaimed very clearly as to just who he is. He is the Son of God. He's coming to this world so that men who are born in darkness might be saved and brought out of darkness into his glorious light. He's come so that people could be saved, can become his disciples, can be made free, and indeed be free indeed. This morning, if you're a child of God, I trust that you look at these verses and you're encouraged. And you look at this and say, well, this is my Savior. He is, he is my God. And He is my Savior. And He is the one that has come, who lives for me, who died for me, and today is still living for me at the right hand of the throne of God. Rejoice in Him. And today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, maybe you've been sitting on the fence as to who Jesus is. Maybe for a long time you've kind of put it to one side. I trust that today you would look at Jesus Christ and recognize exactly who he is. That he is God in the flesh. And he came into this world so that he would pay the penalty, pay the price for your sin so that you could be saved. May God bless you as you think upon these things today. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful for what we see and hear in the word of God today. We thank you for our Lord Jesus.